guys, Jay here. Welcome to Models Memories Weekly, episode 67. Models Memories is a show about nothing and is filmed in front of a live studio audience. This is a show where I talk about my painting, modeling, and wargaming experiences from the week. Now you might think to yourself, Jay, you put out three YouTube videos a week and you stream every single night. Ow! Could you possibly have more to say? Well, I do. And here goes. This was a very fun week of wargaming. I got a little bit of work done and a whole bunch of really cool stuff came out. And let's let's work on the stuff that came out first. Games Workshop came out with a brand new big box for Age of Sigmar. And uh, these boxes always really, really tempt me because I don't own that many models for Age of Sigmar. Whenever a 40K box comes out, it's always like, I like it, but I already own that and that and that and that. So it's not worth it for me to buy it. But the Age of Sigmar stuff is like, I could play Skaven, I could play the, the Lumineth, I could play, I could play the trees. I could be the Lorax. Magical Might comes to the fore in the latest Warhammer Age of Sigmar battle box. Arcane Cataclysm, magical hosts duel in the ruins of Eldritch War. It is the Lumineth Realm Lords versus the Disciples of Zinch. And once it, Age of Sigmar, really, really cool models. Classic Games Workshop fashion, it seems like they're I don't know if they always seem to do this with the new battle boxes. You get two new HQ or single model elite type units. And I wonder if they're not coming out with units for these boxes. I mean, that's not necessarily true because not that long ago we got that big chaos box that came with a bunch of new chaos miniatures. And so they do occasionally release big boxes that have brand new units, but it seems a lot more often they'll just have single you know, two new faction leader models. And that's the the big selling feature of the boxes that comes with those new minis. But this is a situation where you get two new HQE type characters, but they're really good. Ugh. Let's look at the Lumineth one first. We got a new wizard model and ah, I really like it. I'm not the biggest, biggest fan of the Lumineth Realm Lords. I think they're really cool. I like them more than the classic Warhammer Fantasy Battles High Elves, um, especially, I mean, it's 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 kind of uh, not fair to compare them because the High Elves were like sculpts from like 20, 15, I think some of the newest ones are still 10 years old versus models made right now that are perfect, but Dang, this is a really slick model. Great posing. You got the little bonsai tree on the base. A th thick magical staff, which is really, really fun. It's always, it's always, it seems like Games Workshop has tried out a lot of different thicknesses, like different gauges for things like that. And some things work a lot better than others. I think though, thick is the better way to go. I definitely have some Games Workshop models that are very springy on the little detailed stabs and swords. And so I think even though it might look a little bit silly, it doesn't look nearly as silly when you're actually looking at the model in your hands versus like a picture that's blown up 200% size. But I like it because that means that means that this model can take a tumble, which is good because I am a clumsy person and I, I I've dropped probably every model I own. And so it's gonna be really good to have that th thick staff. Ah, the posing on this model is great. I love the bear head. I love the helmeted head. I like the bear head a lot more. The The Realm Lords have these crazy, crazy helmets. And sometimes it's a little much. But uh, the, the helmetless head with the braids, it looks really, really nice. Ah, gosh, these models look like they would be a challenge to paint. But maybe I'm up for that challenge. I'm not going to buy this box, but... It's tempting. It's very, very tempting. You get five riders that look amazing. You get a whole bunch, you get a whole gaggle of archers and some sword wielders. Very nice, very nice. And then the Disciples of Zinch, the new character. Ah, that, so the Lumineth character is called the Sikinari Enlightener, the pure wizard, and then the Cursling. Cursling, that's interesting that they called it that because they already sell a model called the Cursling. That's really interesting. The Cursling, Cursling Eye of Zinch for Age of Sigmar. So yeah, they already have, I wonder if this is gonna replace that model. It looks like it is because it has a lot of the same details. I kind of like the old model too a lot though. I mean, the old model is fine cast, so, but other than that, that's, that's not a bad model. Interesting. I mean, the new model, the new model looks really, really good. 
Uh, the old model has the war, like classic Warhammer Fantasy Battle vibes of like, it would look good on a square base, just, you know, very, very stoic and very cool, but kind of static. Whereas the new model is very dynamic. He's, he's swinging, he's got a kind of sword held back so that he can turn his body to face his opponents. And then he's got his little friend who's got, he's got the stick pointed. I'm sure they're in the process of casting a spell or doing some sort of arcane sorcery. Yeah, the new model is better, but I do, I do like the old model too. If I was, if I was a Disciples of Zinj player, I'd be very tempted to have both. I'm sure it wouldn't make a lot of sense to have both in your force, but sometimes, sometimes your collector brain just takes over and you're like, I want both of the really cool sculpts and it'll look so nice on the shelf. Like maybe, you know, you have, this box comes with a squad of Zangors and a squad of human Zangors. I don't know what they are. And so it'd be kind of nice to have both of the curselings in standing in front of those guys on your shelf. I think that would look real nice. Yeah, I like the new curseling. And speaking of the other Disciples of Zinch, we got some Zangors on Discs of Zinch, which is a really fun thing. I love the Discs of Zinch. I love when stuff like kind of feels very unique and weird, sometimes creatures, sometimes like magical automaton, disky things that just kind of float along on magic is a very unique thing. Like sometimes, sometimes with like Space Marines or Imperial Guard, you can kind of just guess what things are. The snipers, the missile launchers, the guys on the bikes, transport, like it all is kind of self-evident. And although those things are cool, they're not like, oh my God, I've never seen that before in my life. Whereas the, you know, weird bird goat men on floating bladed magical discs, you're not gonna find that too many places. I really, really dig it. Can somebody let me know if discs of Zinch are actually from D&D? I feel like I remember uh, some sort of a creature, some sort of like an umbrella-like creature that was that had magical powers. I don't play D&D, but I know you guys play D&D. Somebody let me know. Is the Disc of Zinch like very similar to a monster from D&D? This box also contains the Kyric Acolytes and the Hordes of Zangors. Now, this is kind of an interesting inclusion in the box because the Zangors are kind of beefy dudes with swords and shields, and the Kyric Acolytes are also beefy dudes with swords and shields. So I wonder, I wonder what kind of dy dynamic they have. Maybe the Zangors are more spellcasters where the buff dudes are more buff dudes. And you know, I'm not knocking buff dudes. I'm fine with that in the box. And I do like when these boxes come with tons of bodies. I remember being kind of underwhelmed with the Chaos Space Marine box that came out a few months ago because it only had like 20 miniatures in it, which when you, when you drop a big amount of money on one of these huge boxes, I feel like you want what's fun is having a table full of models and you put them all together and it's, it just, you want to spend that time to have that investment pay off in hours and hours and hours of modeling and building and painting. And so I have no problem with them shoving in a lot of horde units to really bolster the size of the forces you get. It also just makes it more fun because presumably, I mean, I know a lot of people buy these because oh, I'll just have two armies for Age of Sigmar, but the, the perfect solution to these boxes is you get in with a buddy and you want you and your buddy to both have large, big, fun forces because it's, it's fun moving models. It's fun having models die and be removed from the table. And so you want those big, big hordes of stuff. It also comes with cards and stuff, but who cares? Yeah, this box is cool. This box is really cool. If I was playing Age of Sigmar a lot, which I wish I was, I wish Age of Sigmar is really, really fun, but uh, I don't get a chance to play it very often. I don't get a chance to play much very often. I'm too busy painting, but I really like those horse riders. They just look really, really slick. It's fun. It's fun that Age of Sigmar, since it's, it's fantasy, although it's like, it's almost sci-fi fantasy fiction where where things can be very extreme and exaggerated and not realistic at all. It's just fun to have like horses battling giant warp monsters. Ah, I love it. Age of Sigmar is so much fun. I always, I would love, I would love to have a candid conversation with the sculptors from Games Workshop because I wonder, I wonder if I sat down and if like, you know, they're sitting down at the table and they're all getting assigned their tasks for the week. And like one person like, all right, you are in charge of the new uh, Space Marine Eradicators. And they're like, 
like, fine. And then the guy next to him is like, and you're in charge of the new squig hoppers. And they're like, yes, ah, oh, it's gonna be so much fun. I get to ha make fun, silly expressions and come up with all of these weird things. One of them can be tripping on mushrooms. I can have a little spider screen across the base. Ah, I always, I always wonder about stuff like that because, you know, I've, I've done a lot of artsy stuff and it's, you know, some projects are way more fun than others. And speaking of Games Workshop coming out with new things, uh, last week they came out with a new range of paint, some new colors for contrast and some new formulas for the Citadel Shades. And Juan Hidalgo doing the Lord's work has created a beautiful chart looking at the old versus the new washes. And it's, it's pretty interesting. It looks like they've really dialed in their formula. And it looks like they've kind of dialed in their formula looking at what contrast paint provides. I think Null Noil and Agrax Earthshade will always be in my collection because I just love those paints and what they do. But I have a lot of the other Citadel shades and I don't like them very much because they're so color saturated. Like the great thing about Agrax and Null Noil is you kind of put them on and they don't, they do darken your minis a fair bit, but they don't completely like change everything about the previous layers of paint that you've put on the model. And you can thin the you can thin them a lot to kind of get rid of some of that effect, but I I really liked I really like Agrax Earthshade and Nuln Oil for Games Workshop washes. And then for the other colors, I've actually really been enjoying Army Painters shades. They they kind of do what I wish that some of the Games Workshop shades did, but it looks like that with this new formula, they've kind of fixed it a little bit. Juan Hidalgo compares the, the old with the new, and a lot of, some of them are very similar, but some of them, the old color is much more saturated than the new color. And it looks like the recesses are a lot darker in general with the new formulas, which I really, really like, because I feel like that's exactly what a shade should do. It should glob into those recesses, give you a really harsh line in those recesses, and then just, you know, give up like don't do I don't want you to do more things to my model than that and it looks like these really really do a good job um, the new and old Agrax looks exactly the same the new Nuln Oil looks to be a lot lighter than the old Nuln Oil which is fine which is fine if it, if it gets right into those recesses and gives me a black a black line like a pin shade love it Sir from Sapia looks I mean they all look really really good and so I wonder though if the prompting for this decision is the new contrast paint lines, they do something similar, but giving you a ton of color saturation. And so it seems like they're redoing some of their old paints because now they offer that color saturation, they don't need to do that with the washes anymore. And so, you know, you might you might use a, a, a contrast purple and then also throw on the new Jakari Violet to get those harsh, harsh shadows. I think I think this is really, really good. Uh, I've heard a fair bit of groaning and, you know, upsetness from some, some, some of the community because this change in formula will mean that these new paints are going to look a little bit different than the old ones. I think that that is a hundred percent fine. I, I, I don't think, I don't think it's a good thing to come up with your scheme and then you've got it and you never ever divert because you don't you don't really grow like doing stuff like that. I mean, it depends on what people want out of out of their painting, because some people want to get things done and on the table and some people want to become the very best like no one ever was to try them out is their real quest to collect them all is their goal. But I think I think you really kind of kind of put yourself in a, in a bad spot if you're like, I always, always will put, you know, Yolinden yellow and Drakari Violet and Null Oil and then a dry brushing of, you know, Pallid Bone. And that is what I do every single time for all 10,000 of my whatevers. But if you approach every model with, well, let's, you know, let's try some things out. Let's see, you know, you can, you can take, you can take a formula and then just alter it, change it, twist it a little bit. And I guarantee they'll look fine. They will all look fine together because those subtle changes you might notice them a lot, but other people won't notice them a lot. The camera is probably not going to notice them a lot. I think I think testing and experimenting is a much more interesting process than just a formula. And I think you'll end up having more fun and you'll end up trying more things and enjoying your painting process a lot more 
Like, I know, I remember the last time Games Workshop changed any of their paint recipes, I remember tons of people being like, does anybody have a perfect color match to this paint? But it's like, it's blue. Just go grab a blue. Just go grab a blue and put in a little green if you really want to nail that color. And now you've mixed something, you know more about that blue and about that green and how they perform and how they interact. And you've expanded your knowledge of your paints and what you can do. Like mixing and matching and changing is so much better than just, I don't like that the new Agrax Earth shade is a 2% less color saturated. It's gonna completely ruin my scheme. It'll all be fine. I I am totally fine with uh, with some changes, especially with if they're better. And it definitely seems like these shades are. Years ago, Games Workshop dropped their glaze paints, which I was pretty bummed about because their glaze green was really good for like glowing monitors and screens. But now obviously they have that back with contrast. And I just learned, well, if I just take my bright, you know, Escorpina green from Vallejo and mix it with a little gloss medium, I get I can I have it right back. But yeah, it seems like now, now that they have contrast, super color saturated washes essentially, they can dial back their washes to provide something different that contrast paint doesn't provide. And now they have, you know, their normal paint range, which has some really good colors, you know, like corn red is really, really good. And you know, other paints that suck. Oh my gosh, they're white paint, they shouldn't sell it anymore. I don't know if they ever should have sold it, but. Yeah, I am, I am excited about the Citadel shades. I'll still continue to buy Agrus or Shade Nolan Oil and probably none of the other ones because I like I like Army Painter's Army Painter washes. But yeah, these colors look neat and it's it's cool to see Games Workshop continue to improve. Ooh, the Casadora yellow looks really good. Ah, the 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 recesses are like orange because and that because it's good it gives you a really high amount of contrast between the the recesses and then the main the main body, it's really nice. That is one thing I totally see on the new paints versus the old ones is those those recesses are really, really dark, which is really what you want from a shade. Really cool. I know Games Workshop said it would be a new era of painting and it does not, it doesn't feel like a new era of painting. It feels like, oh, okay, cool. You came out with some new colors because that's what happened, but it is neat. It is neat to see things improve. Yeah, hopefully we won't see any uh, price price rises on the paints because Games Workshop already corners the market on really expensive paint. I mean, until you get to like real artist quality paint, then holy cow, you can, you know, a tube is $50. But, um, but yeah, their stuff is very expensive and uh, Iron Painter stuff is very nice and it's not very expensive. So what I've been working on this week is I've been continuing my Dead Zone building and creating. It's a really, really fun skirmish game that's grid based. So you don't actually have to measure anything. You just, you know, your characters can move vermin. The rat folk can move two cubes with a normal move or they can move three cubes with a sprint. And I really, really enjoy it. I, I love kill team, but I think I really enjoy having multiple games, uh, like multiple games around because I like that different games can give me different things and I'm building my dead zone in a way to give me something that I don't necessarily have with kill team. So that when I'm in the mood for kill team, I can enjoy kill team. And when I'm in the mood for things that kill team can't give me, I can go to dead zone. And so I built a squad of enforcers and all three of these forces are the same points value, but they, they kind of do different things. The vermin is a swarm with a couple of big baddies. The GSPS, the normal guys, are a, a gaggle of soldiers uh, with some elite soldiers that have a lot of things that they can do and some normal pleb soldiers. And the enforcers, which I've built here, are a tiny, tiny little strike force. I'm missing the most important one. There he is. I had this guy like sitting upside down so that he, he dried properly. So we got tons of models, medium number of models, very small collection of models because these guys are super tough and strong. And so they're going to play very, very differently where, you know, vermin die if you look at them and soldiers die if you shoot at them. These guys are so survivable. In the, in the dead zone system, armor value is a thing. If you land hits on models, their armor strips off the number of those hits. And so if you have one armor, you can ignore one dice of damage dealt to you. This big mamma jamma has armor three. 
So if you shoot at this guy and you do three hits, which is a good number of hits, he ignores it. Now there's also armor piercing guns that can, you know, ignore armor. And so you sort of trade some of those dice back in, but you know, armor one, armor three, armor two, and even the normal plebs have armor one. This is going to be a really interesting force to play on the tabletop. Also, you see these shields, these defender shields? If I am in a cube with a defender shield, they both go up one pip of armor. So this, this, that is the theme of this force is armor, playing with the armor rules. And that is gonna be so much fun. And I wanna know when you guys are designing your armies, like what is your, what is the idea in your head? Like, are you basing it off of the rules? Are you basing it off of the lore? Are you basing it off of rule of cool? Cause I feel like I've built forces all three ways. This is definitely, I'm thinking really, really hard about the rules and how I want it to play on the battlefield. Especially since Dead Zone is gonna be a lot of sharing and switching switching armies. I don't, I don't think I'm gonna have one main faction that I always play. I think I'm always gonna be switching up. And so playing on the different rules is gonna make for really, really fun forces. I mean, the Vermin are gonna play very differently versus the Enforcers versus the GSPS. And that's what I wanted out of this. But I have tons of 40K armies where it's just like, I really like the gene stealers and I just want a bunch of gene stealers and aberrants. And so that's what this force is gonna be is I'm just gonna buy all the models I think are cool and then play them on the tabletop. And I don't care that I only lose because I love these models. And there's also there's also other things where I, I just fall in love with one particular element of the lore and I wanna take that element and just build it in real life. And so I would love to know, please leave a comment like, I know, how do you create your war bands and armies and, and cults and gangs? Because I think I think it's really, really interesting. And it's it's kind of really telling about, you know, the difference between tabletop wargaming and some other games where you really you really make a lot of decisions when it comes to what to buy, what forces do you build, what models do you collect and paint? And I think I think it it tells you a lot about kind of that person and the game system and how they enjoy to do things. But yeah, oh, look at that. Look at that big boy. In Dead Zone, a limited number of models can fit in each cube. If you're on a small base, you could fit four of those in a cube. If you're on a medium base, you can fit two. And if you're on a gigantic base like this, only one of these models can fit in a cube, which is a little disappointing because it'd be really fun if I could have the Enforcer Shield or the Defender Shield in the same cube and all of a sudden this guy goes up to a uh, four armor, but I'm fine. I'm fine with just, just armor three. I think that's going to be crazy, crazy fun. Ah, I cannot wait to get these guys painted. I can't wait to get them on the tabletop. I can't wait to get some more factions for Dead Zone. Ah, more games, more games are more fun. You just get to play around with a lot of different things. And you know what? If I'm not feeling Kill Team and I'm not feeling Dead Zone, Malifaux is an incredibly fun skirmish game system that uses cards instead of dice. And so, you know, because it's fun, it's fun to roll dice. In Dead Zone, they have an exploding eight system where every time you roll an eight, you get to roll another dice, which, you know, adds to the fun, the funness of playing that game. But with Malifaux, there's no dice. You just, you make decisions like, you know, attacking and fighting by flipping a 52 deck of playing cards and comparing, you know, how high the card you pulled versus how high your opponent's card is pulled. And you also have an offhand deck of cards that you can cheat from, but you have to think it's like, okay, I've, I've got a pretty weak offhand right now, but I really want my ganger to do a lot of damage to his ganger. Do I, you know, can I fake it out? You know, do I put, do I put a six on a five in the hopes that he's not gonna be willing to pull from his off deck? Or do I kind of just let it go? you know, because he might have an eight or a nine that he can pull from to make sure that he wins this, this engagement. And so, you know, there's all of these different games have a little, a little something special about them that gives it a different feel, a different flavor. And that is really, really fun. And speaking of Dead Zone and all of the wonderful things I want to buy, another thing that I love about different games is that they give me the opportunity to collect different things. And so I was looking through the Dead Zone catalog and seeing like, what is something that is very different from the units that I can collect for Kill Team? Because I wouldn't want, I don't want to paint the same thing twice. And so I found that they sell the Asterion Mastodon Booster. And these guys are Fat Lizard Samurai. That is the greatest thing I have ever heard. 
I mean, looking at the models, they are fantastically weird. They are fat lizard samurai. I mean, brilliant. I love it. It's amazing. I can't wait to get these guys. Once again, they're going to have a different play style because even the enforcers, you know, I've got one mega tough guy, medium tough guys, and small tough guys. This is going to be an army of only tough guys. And so I can't wait to see how they play on the tabletop and to paint up some fat lizards. It's so weird and wacky and interesting. Ah, that is going to be a very, very interesting paint job. And some of them have samurai swords and some of them have like giant portal laser guns. One of them's just got a cattle prod and he's got like X-wing X wings on his shoulder armor. It's just so weird and wacky. And that is a, that is a group of miniatures that I am very, very excited to collect. That's what's so great about the miniature miniature war hammer sphere. There's so much. There's so much. Almost anything you can think of, it exists somewhere in some miniature wargaming line. And you know what? Maybe, maybe one day I'm gonna be so burnt out on all of this cool, amazing, awesome science fiction goodness, lasers, spaceships, robots, clones, all of this amazing, interesting stuff. Maybe one day I'll be like, you know, all of that's cool, but I would much rather play as the French. And I'll get into a <laughs> I'll get into a historical game. Probably not. But uh I I sort of see the appeal because every now and then I'll watch like a history channel documentary and I'll be like, "Oh, that was fun learning about that topic." I don't know if that I'll ever be so engrossed that I'm going to be like, "You know, I want to sit down and collect and learn and paint all about that." But uh it is uh, it, it's it's huge. The the historical wargaming sphere is huge. And there are some games that do pique my interest. Usually there's stuff where it's fake history. Um, there's a really cool game called War Gods of Olympus that has that's kind of based in the the classic myths. And so you can play as armies of the classic myths and it's really, really interesting. And then there's like, I think, is it dust? or Conflict 47, our alternate universe, like World War II, but what if aliens landed and oh, and there's also werewolves. Like that sort of stuff is like, okay, a really cool take on something that we already know. Ah, I love I love just taking any opportunity I can to, uh, to dunk on historical war games. <laughs> I don't mean to. It's just, I just love science fiction and fantasy so much that, uh, yeah, but boy, would I have to be scraping the bottom of the barrel before I, I make my way through through the bottom and into historical wargaming. Maybe though, maybe one day somebody will come out with the perfect game where it's just like, you know, the models may not excite me, but damn, the rules are just so good. Although I don't I don't particularly care about rules that much. I think I think the world I think all the rules have to be is an excuse to see what happens. Like, hey, let's see what happens when my orc commandos fight your uh, Krieg veteran uh, veteran guard. And if the, if the rules facilitate just seeing what happens when those two factions fight, I think, I think it is well worthwhile. That is what I worked on this week and I had tons and tons of fun working on some fun futuristic miniatures. And if you wanna have a lot of fun working on some fun futuristic models, we have a new miniature of the month a futuristic elven warlock, and we also have some really cool terrain to go along with it. We also have one extra episode of Eon's Battle every single week. We have a weekly hobby hangout where we all hop into a Discord room and just chit chat the night away. It's one of my favorite things we do. We just have a wonderful time just shooting the breeze. We also have voting on what models I paint live here on YouTube. By the way, I live stream every night from 9 to 10 p.m. Central. Come hang out and more. It's the best way to support us and get even more Eon's of Battle. With that said, I have a lot more dead zone to put together and paint, so I'm gonna go do that.